if you have, or all summer, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. If you haven't given up on bringing your Bible during this series, because I've had just sort of scattered all throughout different places in Scripture, and we'll focus in today on Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 1 to 5, but we're continuing uh, in our summer series that we call Tackling Tough Questions. We've looked at a lot of good questions, and today we have another really good question that we're going to look at, and um, I think it would be helpful for you to hear the whole question. It's a bit long. The, the entirety of the question is a bit long, but I think it will show uh, kind of where this question is coming from, okay? So here's, here's the whole thing, uh, and then we'll get to the heart at the very last sentence, uh, but the question goes, I recently listened to a pastor on the radio talking about how we are to judge or hold accountable our fellow believers. And then in James chapter 2, we're told not to judge or show favoritism to others, which seems to be in relation to their status. And then I also listened to another pastor saying that believers won't be judged by God because God looks on us and sees Jesus. Anyway, I'm confused about the whole judgment thing. Do we judge or not? If so, who do we judge and are we judged? All right, that's a lot, but the question itself, question itself, do we judge or not? If so, who do we judge and are we judged? Okay, so let me just start by saying I, I think I understand the confusion in the question. I think I got whiplash just reading it. Yes, we judge. No, we don't judge. Yes, we judge. So, so I get that, but it's not that the question itself is confusing. The question is a good question, particularly now in this day and age. This is one of the more popular verses uh, in the Bible, even for people who don't um, believe in Jesus. People know this verse. And so in a time when people know just enough about the Bible to be dangerous, this is a good question. This is a really good question. Because you will hear people say, don't judge. That's a, that's a, a common refrain. Don't judge. You can't judge. You, you don't have any right to judge me. But the people that say that don't understand what the Bible actually says about it. Right? So they're just dangerous enough that they know what it says, but they don't know what it means. That's dangerous. When you're, when you're quick to hurl something out there, uh, that the Bible says, and, and speak on behalf of God, you need to, to know what you're talking about, all right? And I think the heart of the confusion here is, is not knowing or forgetting that words can have different meanings or different connotations depending on the context. You realize that, right? If you were here in our Bible translation message back at the beginning of the summer, you, you understand that idea. You understand that different words can have different connotations or meanings depending on the context. So lots of words don't just have one sense or one meaning. They have a range of meaning. When you bring that into study and interpretation of the Bible, we call that a semantic range, that words have a semantic range. Or they can mean any number of a range of different things within that range. And so it could mean one thing in one context and another thing in a different context. But, but the bottom line is that the context determines the specific meaning that that word has out of the whole range of possible meanings. Does that make sense? Or is that too technical? It's probably pretty technical. But I think it makes sense. It's, it's obvious enough. The context tells you exactly what the word means in any given situation. And so in this question, you have judge used in three different contexts with three slightly different meanings each time. And I want to start, I want to go in reverse order here, um, starting with the third example. In the third example, it's God judging us. And in that context, it's talking about the final judgment. It would mean something like condemned to eternal punishment. So you say, what does that word mean? It's judgment in the sense of condemnation to eternal punishment. And so in that sense of the word, 
the pastor, and she mentioned in the question this, that uh, she thought the pastor was David Jeremiah. Well, David Jeremiah is absolutely right there, or whoever it was, is absolutely right there. In that sense of the word, Christians are free from judgment. Praise the Lord. Are you not glad that you are free from God's eternal condemnation and judgment? That is what the gospel does. It frees us from God's wrath and from his judgment in our lives eternally. We see that, among other places, in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, where Paul writes, there is therefore now, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So that is so true that when God looks at us on that final judgment day, he will declare us innocent on the basis of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so in the same way, believers are not to condemn other people or to pronounce that final judgment on others. That is not our place to do that. That is God's business to condemn. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, therefore do not pronounce judgment when? Before the time, before the Lord comes. So there is a time for that judgment, judgment in the sense of a, a final condemnation, a final unveiling of who in fact does belong to Christ and who does not. And that time is not in this life. And there is also not only a time for that to happen, but a person who is in charge of that. And guess who it's not? Us, right? That's not for us to do. That is for God to do at the proper time. So the second example uh, from James chapter 2 is about exactly what the question said it was about. It's judgment in the sense of showing favoritism towards people with more money or more social status. And on the flip side of that, it's, it's judgment in the sense of, of discriminating against people with less social status and less money in particular. So that would be something like saying, and this is within the body of Christ, uh, uh, that's who James is addressing, this happening within the church, that in the church there would be leaders or people in general in the church that would show favoritism to people based on their social status or how much money they make. Right? So that would be like in here, we, we decide that you can't vote in this church unless you give a certain amount of money. You don't give enough money, you don't have a say in things. Or it'd be like going up to someone that maybe would be seen as having a lower social status and asking them to get up because there's someone that has a higher social status within the church that would like to have that seat. So you need to get up for them. You know, it would be things like that. It's basically treating people or seeing people or judging people on the basis of the way that man sees people rather than on the basis of the way that God sees people or judges people. So in that sense, do you think that Christians are supposed to do that? Are we supposed to judge in that way by showing favoritism uh, towards people of higher social status? Absolutely not. We are condemned from doing that, you know, forbidden from doing that. That is, that's not for us to do. James made that very clear in that text. That is not, there's no place for that in the church and among God's people. So in that sense, no, we do not judge people like that. In this church, I have no idea who gives. No idea. All of our entire budget could be given by three people, and I would not know. I hope that's not the case, all right? I don't think it is, but I, but, but, but I wouldn't know it. I, I don't know that. I don't know who gives, and I don't know how much you give, all right? And that's intentional. I, I think I could probably figure it out. I could probably look, but I don't. I don't do that. I choose not to because I never want to be tempted to treat someone better because of how much they give or their status or treat someone worse because of how little that they give or their status. I could not care less what your status is, and I don't know how much you give, all right? So we don't judge in that sense. And so that leaves us then with the first example, which he described it as judging by holding other believers accountable for their sins. Another way of saying that would be to call believers out for their sins. It's, it's calling someone out. And I'm saying believers like that, or brothers and sisters, I'm saying that on purpose because Christians aren't to, to hold lost people accountable for their behavior and for their sins. We're just not. Not, not in an interpersonal sense, 
We can speak to the ills of society. We can speak to the, 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 the sins that are collective in our, our world, in our government, among our leaders, among whatever the case may be. But at an interpersonal level, that, that's not for us to do, to judge or call out non-believers for their sins and behavior. I've said this a hundred times. Lost people do lost people things. And we should not expect anything else, right? So if a lost person says, as they often do, if a lost person says to you, hey, you don't have a right to judge me, guess what? They're actually telling you the truth. You, you, you really don't. We're not called to hold them accountable. But that only applies outside the family, outside the people of God, that applies. But inside the family, it's a different story. Inside the family of God, we are all, listen, responsible for one another. We're responsible for one another. Not in the sense that I'm held responsible directly for your sin. It's not that. Did you ever play sports growing up and, and, and one person messed up? They missed a block if you're talking about football. They threw an errant pass in basketball, you know, turnovers, whatever the case might be. And the whole team has to run. Remember that? Like, oh, God, we all got to run because of what this person did, right? So it's not like that. It's not that we all are held responsible for each other's sins, but it's more in the prophetic sense. And what I mean by that, if you look in the Old Testament, if you look at God's instruction to the prophets, the prophets were responsible for delivering the message to the people of God. They were not responsible for the way the message was received by those same people, right? So as long as the prophet declared the word of the Lord to those people, called them to repent, then he had done his job. And it's the same sense for us. We all function in some ways prophetically in one another's lives, where we declare things, we call things, we, we, we share things, and then that individual Christian is responsible for whether they hear that or not. So it's, it's, a, it's a helping sense. It's not a negative. It's not a condemning sense, right? The way that Christians do this is not in a condemning sense in our lives, but in a helping sense. It's that I see something in you that, that dishonors God, that's you walking down the wrong path. It's not that, that you're not walking in obedience to, to God, to Jesus, to the word of the Lord. And, and I want to help you with that. And in the same way, you want to do the same thing to me. You see something in me. I'm not leading well. I'm leading harshly. I'm leading too critically, whatever it might be. Whatever sin that you, that you see in me, you're helping me to do battle with sin. So we all, in that sense, share in that fight with one another. That, that's, that's what the Christian life needs to be. That's what the body of Christ needs to be, that we all share in the fight against sin. But this is also the place where we find maybe the most resistance, because most all of us do not like to call out sin in other people to their face. Oh, man, we love, man, we love to talk about your sin to other people when you're not there. Just not to your face. And Brett, I, I, I don't mean you in particular. I'm just looking at you. you. You know, you made a good example. But if anybody knows anything that Brett needs to turn from after church, he's going to be waiting for you to come point that out in his life. But, but yeah, so that's gossip. We, we, we really like to gossip. We like to talk about your sin, just not to you about your sin. But a lot of times... A lot of times, the way that it works is the only way that we will take the step to call out sin in somebody else is after they've taken a step to call out something in our lives, right? So someone comes to you with something that, that they see in your life, and at that moment, you're like, oh, well, well, thank you for pointing that out, and you know. While we're talking about it, I got a few things I need to tell you about in your life that I'd like to point out. It's like we want to make them pay, right? I'm going to make you pay for calling sin in my life. It makes us, it makes us kind of mad when we do that. That's our, that's our instinct or whatever. And so because it's uncomfortable in both directions, it's uncomfortable for the one being called out, it's uncomfortable for the one calling out, then what mostly happens is we choose to just look the other way while brothers and sisters are walking off track. 
It's like, I see you, but I'm pretending not to see you. You see me, but you're pretending not to see me. You look the other way. And we do that in the name of keeping the peace, being nice, being, you know, loving, whatever. But listen, that is not, that is a false unity. It is not nice, and it's not loving to do that. No more than it's loving to know that the bridge is out up ahead and you're driving towards the bridge that's out and you're going to plunge. And I know it and I see you driving and instead of waving you down and saying stop before you drive off the edge, you just kind of just go, "Mm." I didn't see, I didn't see that. That's not loving, is it? No, no, we judge in that sense because we love. We judge because we want God's best in each other's lives. That's why. And so then for the rest of the time, I I want to talk about how we judge. If we are called to do that, then how do we do it? And, And not really the mechanics of it. I don't want to talk about the mechanics. I want to talk about the motivations behind it. I want to talk about the intentions. I want to talk about the heart behind it because you can judge You can do the right thing. You can judge. But if you do it for the wrong reason and with the wrong motivation, then you're turning a good thing into a bad thing. And that is really Jesus' focus all throughout the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. Jesus is focusing on getting below the surface of people's behaviors and to the heart that is underneath that behavior. And the key heart issue that Jesus talks about here is having a judgmental heart. That's the heart issue here. He goes to the heart of of many other things in this sermon, but here it's a heart of judgmentalism. And and a judgmental heart is a self-righteous heart. Do you know any self-righteous people? A, a, A judgmental heart is a conceited heart. There's an arrogance to judgmentalism. A a judgmental heart lacks love and mercy. Instead of love and mercy, there's nothing but harshness to it. A judgmental heart, this is important, is not about helping you in your battle with sin. It's about tearing you down to make myself feel better in comparison. That's what a judgmental heart, at the heart of judgmentalism, is a desire to tear someone down many times to make yourself feel better. I I can't feel good about me until I tear you down. That's that's judgmentalism. And there is no place for that kind of judgment. There's no place for judgmentalism among the people of God. And so we have to figure out how do we do the good thing? How do we judge without being judgmental? That's the issue. All right, and so... If you have your Bible open, let's go ahead and read the text, and let's see how Jesus addresses the topic here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, probably most famous verse in the Bible right now, judge not. Let's just stop right there and close the sermon. You know, that's all that needs to be said, right? Judge not. That's as far as most people ever take it. Judge not. That you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So I want to ask you, or I want to get you to ask yourself three questions before you choose to judge a brother or sister. Here's three questions to ask yourself before you judge. Before you judge, ask yourself, first of all, am I being hypercritical? I preached this before, by the way. Am I being hypercritical? hypercritical. So I want to point out a few things in verse 1 and 2 here. And the first one is a general principle uh, that Jesus gives us a bunch of times in the Gospels. It's a principle that you find throughout much of the Bible, in, in the New Testament in particular, and that is that God will treat you the way that you treat others. 
God will treat you the way that you treat others. I, I, I don't mean your eternal destination. I'm not sure exactly what this looks like. I, I don't know when this happens, this treatment. I, I, I don't know that. I don't know if this is talking about rewards in heaven. I don't know if it's talking about status in the kingdom of God exactly. I, I don't know that. All I know is that Jesus says that the measure we use to others is going to be the same measure that God uses with us. It doesn't say God uses, but that's a divine passive in that phrase there. It'd be the same measure that God uses with us. That's the way that we forgive others, the way that we treat others, the way that we show mercy to others, the way that we love others right here, the way that we judge others. It goes right along with something James said in James 2.13. He said, for judgment without mercy to one, or for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. You've shown no mercy to a brother, you will be shown no mercy. That's, that's the general principle that's outlined there. All right, so then you have to look then at the measure that you use. Now, that word measure is the same word that we get our word metric from. We don't use the metric system here in the United States, um, but, but it's the word where the word comes from, right? Measure or metric. And so the metric that I use to judge other people is going to be the same metric that God uses on me. Okay, so what type of metric then is Jesus warning about here in this passage? Well, he's warning against a hypercritical metric. Hypercritical unveils your judgmental heart. If you are a hypercritical person, then you are dealing in your heart with a judgmental heart. So being hypercritical means using an extreme measure in the way that you judge others. Right? It's being overly critical. It's being too critical or it's being too quick to judge. Do you know anybody that's, that's too critical in their judgment? Do you know anybody that's too quick to jump in and judge? That is a hypercritical heart. See, critical is good. Hypercritical is not good. There is a big difference between being hypercritical and being critical. But I think the biggest difference is not necessarily the degree. In other words, not how much you do it or how fast. The biggest difference between the two is not really the degree but it's the intention behind it. That, that being critical is all about building people up. It's about building people up. It's about giving them something that they can work on so that they can grow, improve, do better, something that helps them. And that is a good thing. We don't always like criticism. We, we don't always enjoy criticism. But criticism in itself is not a bad word. If it's done with the right heart, the right motivation and intention, then criticism or being critical is not a bad thing. But being hypercritical is the opposite. It's not about building up. Being hypercritical is all about tearing people down. It is destructive instead of constructive. And so before you speak a word of judgment to a brother or to a sister, ask yourself, am I, this is getting to the heart of it, am I trying to build this person up or am I trying to tear this person down? And if it's the first, if, if I'm trying to build that person up, then it's probably okay for you to say the thing that you are going to say. But if your intention is to tear down, if that's really the heart of it, then it's probably best to leave it unsaid. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives six ways that this hypercritical spirit tends to come out in people. And, and I want to give you four of them. These are the best four to me. And you listen to this and see if any of these look like you, okay? Does this look like the way that you judge other people? So first of all, a hypercritical person gives judgment when the matter is of no concern to them. Do, do you know anybody that likes to criticize things that they don't care about with people they have no concern with. That's basically a picture of social media. That's pretty much all of social media. It's criticizing things and people that we don't even care about the thing and we don't have any concern or care about the individual itself. This is basically, he calls these people, he says that they take malicious pleasure in it. We call those trolls. That's a troll, right? A troll just takes malicious pleasure in, in doing this. 
It's like a hobby to them. There's great joy in, in being hypercritical in that sense of the word, right? Things we don't care about, people we don't care about. Second of all, he says a hypercritical person puts personalities in the place of principle. And basically what he means by that is I have a personal problem with someone that leads me then to attribute motives to them. This, this is huge in general. It's definitely huge in ministry. People think people love to attribute motives into our lives. Right? They don't know our heart. They don't know what our actual motivation is or the reasoning behind things or whatever, but they, they come in and then they're, they're hypercritical in the sense of attributing motives to what we say. It's personal, not about the principle of the matter. Number three, a hypercritical person expresses their opinion without a knowledge of all the facts. Is that anybody in here? Don't raise your hand. Expresses opinions without knowledge of all the facts. So that's ignorant criticism. There's a lot of ignorant criticism out there, right? That's, that's hypercritical. It's an ignorant criticism. I'm going to rush in to, to, to judge even though I don't know the facts. And then number four, a hypercritical person never takes the trouble to understand the circumstances and is never ready to excuse. It is never ready to exercise mercy. Never ready to exercise mercy. They, they don't know all the circumstances and they don't bother to investigate, but they rush in very quickly with a harshness and without mercy. See, we, people like that, they, they, they only believe in mercy when you're talking about them. Right? For everybody else, it's harshness. For everybody else, it, 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 it's no grace. It's lack of mercy. But, but for me... It's mercy. All right, so, so what is the measure that you use before you judge? What's the measure? Do you, do you judge hypercritically? Are you too harsh in your judgment? Do you judge in ignorance without knowing the facts, without knowing the details, without understanding the circumstances? Are you quick to run in with justice versus mercy? What measure do you use? Listen to this. It's dangerous to use the wrong measure because, listen, you are handing God the ruler that he's going to use on you. You're handing God the ruler he's going to use on you. Second question to ask yourself before judging. So first of all, it's, am I being hypercritical? Number two, am I being hypocritical? Am I being hypocritical in my judgment? Look at verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? Verse 5, you hypocrite. I love the way Jesus illustrates things. But this is one of, this is not a criticism, by the way, of the Son of God. This is one of the most absurd illustrations that you'll ever see in the Bible. But I think it's intentionally absurd. I'm not calling Jesus absurd. I'm saying he's using an intentionally absurd illustration to make it more memorable right here. So in this illustration, you have two people here. And you have one that has a speck in their eye. That speck would be something like a little bit of sawdust. Have you ever you know, been cutting wood? If you're a woodcutter, I'm not. But I've been there when it happens. So you ever done that and a little speck of sawdust just flies up and just gets in your eye. Or just You're cutting grass maybe. And while you're cutting grass, you run over some dirt and a little speck gets in your eye. No big deal. That's not the absurd part, right? We've all had specks of dust, sawdust, dust, whatever it might be. Little bits of dirt in our eye. No big deal. We just go, we just wash it out. We blink a few times. It's gone, whatever, whatever the case might be. But then you have another man here in the illustration that he says has a log in their eye. And this is the absurd part because a log would, would, would refer to like a beam that would be like the, the door frame beam as you go into a room or a house or a ceiling beam that helps structurally hold the, the house up. All right, that's the absurdity in this to imagine someone walking around with a giant like beam sticking out of their eye. And he asked the one then with that beam, that log, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye but not the log in yours? 
You see the speck, you don't see the giant log in your brother's eye. Now, Jesus asked this question, but he's not really asking a question that he doesn't know the answer to, all right? He's, he's asking the question as a way of setting up the answer here. Why do you do this? What's the answer? Well, verse 5, hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. This is a picture of hypocritical judgment. And hypocritical judgment, just like hypercritical judgment, comes out of a judgmental heart. And so the sawdust here represents some minor offense, some minor sin. And I know we say all sin is the same, but that's not exactly true. All sin will condemn you, but not all sin is equally weighty. Um, So it represents some minor offense that someone has. Uh, in their life, doesn't matter what it is. And then the log represents some major, some major thing, major offense, major sin in someone's life. Again, it doesn't matter what the case is, but the one with the bigger sin is trying to judge and call out the one that has the small sin in their life. It would be like you just stole from someone, you just stole someone's car, and now you're mad, and you're like, well, you know, you were going 63 in a 60. It'd be like that. The, the major thing trying to judge the little thing. It'd be ridiculous, right? It'd be ridiculous. You catch the guy and he's like, oh, I only stole because he was going three over the speed limit. You shouldn't have been going so fast. I wouldn't have noticed you. Right? It's, it's, it's absurd. It's absurd. So let me ask you this. Are you hypocritical in the way that you judge? What does that look like? How, how does that come out. What does hypocritical judgment tend to look like? Well, first of all, do you judge others for things when you do the same things or worse? In that textbook definition, hypocrisy, you judge others, you call out others when you do the same thing or something worse. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 says, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same things. So why do we do that? Why would we judge someone when we have the same or worse in our lives? Well, sometimes we do it because we just feel guilty about the sin that we have in our lives, and we don't know how to deal with that guilt. And rather than dealing with the guilt ourselves, we call other people out. So sometimes this is guilt in our lives because we haven't properly dealt with our sin, because we haven't properly repented of our sin. Sometimes it's just because sin blinds us. Sometimes sin can blind us. Jesus said, do you not notice the log? Sometimes we just, we just don't notice the log that is sticking out of our eye. It's like it's, it's so close, it's so big and so close to us that it blocks out our field of vision and keeps us from seeing what it, what, what's actually stuck in our eye. It's like, have you ever observed something under a microscope where, where you go in really, 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 really close and say, what is that thing? I have no idea what it is. Why? I'm so close to it. And you have to pull out. And as you pull out a little bit, it begins to take shape and you begin to notice what it is. And so sometimes... What we have to do is, sometimes we have to be willing to pull back a little bit. Sometimes we have to be willing to step back just a little bit and really look at our lives and make sure that we're not passing that judgment on someone when we're doing the same thing or something worse. Then the second way that hypocrisy comes out is you just think you're better than other people. That's a hypocritical type judgment, that you think that that you don't see yourself in the same place as someone else. You think you're better. This comes out as a smug attitude, that self-righteous attitude where we think that we're above other people before God. It's kind of like the two men walk into the temple. One of them is beating their breast, the sinner, and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the right attitude, right? God, have mercy on me. Well, the other one looks at this man, and he says, God, I thank you I'm not like this guy. That's that's hypocritical judgment, right? Rather than seeing that you're the same before God as this guy is. You're both brothers and sisters in Christ. You both are children of God. You're no better than anyone else. Again, in Romans, Paul said, 14.10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Are, are you, why do you despise your brother? 
for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We're all one day going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. You don't escape that. I don't escape that. Paul said, why do you despise your brother and judge him? So we, so we just think we're better. What that really looks like is, I despise you because you're worse than me. I despise you. Do you have that type of judgment in your heart? So number one, number one, am I being hypercritical? Number two, am I being hypocritical? And then number three, we'll finish with this. Am I being clear-sighted? Am I being clear-sighted? Verse five says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So, so there's two things that I want to point out before I close here. First of all, notice that Jesus does not say here, you hypocrite, mind your own business. He doesn't say that, does he? That, that's not, th this is getting to the application, right? What, what's the punchline here? This is what it all builds up to. Notice he doesn't say, notice he doesn't say, you hypocrites, mind your own business. That is what we wish Jesus would have said. We wish he would have said that because that's what we want to say. We want to say, mind your own business. That's why everybody's so quick to quote verse 1, but not verse 5. That's why everybody's so quick to say, don't judge. You can't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge. But we are twisting Jesus when we do that because that is not all that Jesus said. If you quote verse 1 and leave out verse 5, you're missing the entire point. He tells us that we ought to help our brothers and sisters deal with the sin in our lives, that we do not need to leave them in it, and they don't need to leave us in it. Because listen to this, when we fail to call that out in someone, when we fail to, in love, help keep them accountable for the, the behavior and the way that their lives are being lived and the way that it goes out of step with the Lord, we are actually stunting their Christian growth and their sanctification. Because the way that I grow in Christ's likeness, how does that happen? It happens only as I put off the old. It's not just because I heard a message from the Bible. It's not because I read about it. It's not because I think it's a good idea. No, it happens because I, I, I'm responding to God's truth and God's word in my own life, right? I, I'm putting off the old in my life. I'm putting off that old me, my flesh, or whatever you want to call it. And I'm putting on the traits of the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is being produced in me. I'm abiding in Jesus. He's beginning to shape me and to grow me and to mold me one step at a time, long obedience in the same direction all throughout the course of my life. And God uses me to help you see what you need to put off and on. And God uses you to help me see what I need to put off and put on in my own life. And if you do not help me see the speck that's in my eye, it's just going to stay there, irritating Redness, itching, burning. It's just going to be there. I won't see what's in my eye. And so judgment is one of the ways that we help each other grow. We, we do it in love. It's, it's because I love God above all things. And because I love you. And I want to see you walking and growing in the Lord. So I, I, I point this out because I love you. I point this out because I want you to grow. But then this is the main point. You have to be clear-sighted enough to help. And to do that, you need to deal with your sin first. That's the punchline here. That, that you would take the log out of your eye and then, it's only then that you can see clearly enough to help that brother or that sister with the sawdust in their eyes. And that's the rub. That, that's what's getting in the way too many times. It's not just we want to be nice. We don't want to be mean. It's we don't want to deal with the sin in our life. 
that's, that's the bottom line for, for some of us, maybe, maybe many of us. We just don't want to deal with that. And so when you talk about judging other believers, where's the place to start? Well, the place to start is your own eye. That's where you start. And I'm going to close right there. What's in your eye? What, what is the sin in your life that you need to turn from now? I mean, it could be anything. How's the Lord speaking to you right now? Is there something in your, in your mind that he's calling to your attention calling to your to your heart right now he's speaking to you right now and he's saying that's it for you M maybe it's a judgmental heart maybe that's what comes out of this maybe you realize yeah my heart's judgmental i have the wrong motives i have the wrong intentions that's why i'm hypercritical that's why i'm so quick to judge i, I need to turn from being hypercritical maybe it's hypocritical I need to turn. I think I've been thinking I'm better. I've been walking around thinking I'm God's gift to the church. I'm God's gift to the kingdom. God should be thankful to have me on the team as opposed to you. Is it hypocritical judgment? What is it? What is it that you need to turn from? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's turning from resistance to being corrected. Is that you? You're the first to blow up when somebody points something out in your life. I don't want you, don't you tell me what I'm doing in my life. Maybe you've confused correction, which is what this is. Maybe you've co confused correction for condemnation. And that brother that's speaking into your life, that sister that's speaking into your life, you're thinking it's condemning you but they're just trying to correct because they love you, because they want to see you grow. And I wonder if in your life, is it pride that's keeping you from receiving that correction? Is it your pride? What is it? You know, whatever it is that God's been dealing with you about this morning, I, I, I can tell you this with absolute confidence. Now is the best time to deal with it. Not because of where we are, but because right now you're being confronted with the word. So what are you going to do with it? How are you going to respond? As we close this morning, I want you to know this is not just a message about judgment. It's a message about dealing with the sin in your own life. That you might see clearly enough to help your brother and your sister in love be what God has for them to be and in doing that you're being what God has for you to be so you consider how God would have you respond and in these moments whether it's in your seat whether you need to come and pray you need someone to pray with whatever it is maybe you need to give your life to the Lord I don't know how God's speaking to you now but however it is now is the time to respond